Okay, um, welcome to the Humane Artificial Intelligence webinar on AI for manufacturing. Uh, my name is Ali Abedi. I'm Associate Vice President for Research at University of Maine, and I'm excited to introduce our panel of expert speakers from academia, industry, and government agencies to talk about uh, what's happening on artificial intelligence use in manufacturing and materials. So from wherever you're joining us, either from the West Coast or East Coast of United States or from Europe um, in IEEE India or IEEE China colleagues, I welcome everybody here. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where in the world you're tuning in. Um, we are going to have each speaker talk for almost 10 minutes about um, the topic of AI for manufacturing. Uh, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A as they come to your mind. And after all the four speakers are talking, uh, talks are over, then I will um, pose the questions and then we can go over the question and uh, answer period toward the end of the program. So this is a one hour webinar. It will be recorded and um, we'll post it basically later on. So with that um, further ado, let me um, let's start uh, the panel by introducing our first speaker. Um, Dr. Tony Schmitz is a professor in mechanical, aerospace, and biomedical engineering department at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, with a joint uh, faculty appointment at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's a very uh, distinguished um, and accomplished researcher. If I want to read his bio, it will take the entire hour, so we'll skip that. But I will just highlight that he is one of the experts in the country in terms of uh, manufacturing, and also uh, he has received a, a number of awards and recognitions, like Young Investigator Award and NSF Career Award. He has lots of patents and publications, so we are very honored and excited to uh, listen to Dr. Schmitz today. So, uh, Tony, take it away. Thank you. I, I can only go down from there, so let me let me try to do my best. Um, so my interest is in trying to understand how we can leverage advances in machine learning for machining. So machine learning for machining, and in particular, milling operations is what I'm interested in. Um, so how can we kind of bridge this gap between um, the great work that's been done in machine learning and the manufacturing shop floor? So I'm going to describe today one particular um, implementation of machine learning, and I'm going to use models that we've developed in the past for machining as a way to guide um, that machine learning process. So this physics-guided machine learning approach says, um, I have some physics-based models. I can use those as a low-cost way to generate a lot of data to initially train my machine learning model. But because I have uncertainties associated with that physics-based model, I can improve my machine learning model now by collecting new data and adding that to the original data set that was provided by my physics-based models. So I'm gonna show that application with relation to milling. So first I'll talk just a bit about machine learning um, and then the models that we apply, the physics-based models. And then I'll demonstrate briefly a case study that we completed to demonstrate this approach. So machine learning, as we know, is a data-driven approach. Um, we have machine learning and statistical techniques, which can both be applied, where I want to learn from my either continuous sensor data or discrete measurement results during or after the manufacturing process. So this is, this is a great advantage when I don't have a great a, an, an understanding of the relationship between the inputs and outputs for my manufacturing process. Um, in, that, in that way, I can develop those correlations simply from the data that I collect during the process. The challenge is that those correlations don't know about my physical laws, and sometimes they can lead me to a place I didn't want to go because either inadequate data or uncertainty in my data and so on. And, and it may be difficult to generalize beyond that training data set. So in this work, we're leveraging machine learning, in particular classification, which is a supervised learning approach where I'm trying to collect data and then make decisions based on that data um, by classifying the outcomes. For example, 
If I showed you um, a face image, you could tell me probably whether that was a male or a female. Um, in the same way, what I want to do here is I want to introduce the, you to a spindle speed and chip width combination for my machining parameters, and then have you tell me, is that going to be stable or unstable? In other words, am I going to get good machining performance or poor machining performance from that combination? There's lots of choices, and we've applied some of those. The one I'll show you today is a K nearest neighbor, very simple approach. Okay, so I said we're going to have physics-based models that we're going to use to train our algorithm. So one of the things I need to know is the vibration behavior of this tool holder spindle machine combination that I selected for this machining activity. So we're going to use an approach where we take models of the holder and tool, and then we couple them in the frequency domain to a measurement of the spindle and, and machine in order to predict those assembly dynamics, or what's the vibration response at the, at the end of my cutting tool where I'm gonna be performing the machining test. So there's lots of equations here, but essentially what this is saying is if I can describe the dynamics of my components of my individual pieces, then there's, a, there's an analytical way to put those dynamics together to predict the assembly dynamics. And so ultimately, um, by following um, the, the modeling of the individual pieces, compatibility conditions at the boundary, and then equilibrium conditions where I'm connecting things, I end up with an equation which says I can predict the assembly dynamics from the component dynamics. So that's one of the models. So I have you shown there, that's a milling cut for those of you who, who haven't spent a lot of time around milling machines. So what you saw was a rotating tool removing material and flinging these chips away as it, as it cut away that material. So one of the things we need to understand is that the tool is not rigid and there's forces applied to that tool, dynamic forces in order to fling away those chips. And so that leads to a situation where I have vibrations during my cutting process and those vibrations can be good, what we call forced vibrations, or there can be bad, what we call chatter or self-excited vibrations. Um, so in terms of that modeling, I have a mechanistic approach to describe those vibrations, which includes cutting force. That cutting force we estimated using finite element simulation um, to determine these coefficients that relate the force to the chip that I'm removing. Okay, so if I have my structural dynamics that I predicted and my cutting force model that I predicted, I can bring those together into a frequency domain solution that separates the bad vibrations, chatter, from the good vibrations, the stable or forced vibrations. And so the gray region in that plot is the, is the bad vibrations, and the white region is where we have um, good machining behavior. Okay, so the big thing I, that I face when modeling mechanistically, when I use physics-based models to describe this approach is, if I make a prediction and then perform an experiment and that experiment doesn't agree with my prediction, I do not have a backwards solution. I only have the forwards solution. So that's what was very intriguing to me about machine learning is to enable me to connect my experimental result to um, the inputs in a way that wasn't available to me before. So here's a case study that we ran. I said, fine, I'm gonna start with the models but I'm gonna interject errors into those models. So they're gonna be not quite right. And then I'm gonna compare the, the initially trained model, um, the, the machine learning model to um, the, true, the true behavior by adding points. So I'll add points to the original data set one at a time um, until I converge on that true solution. Okay, so using this K nearest neighbor approach, I trained it um, from the original data that had errors in it. And then now I have a mapping between stable and unstable behavior in my model. So that's the gray zone there. The, the blue curve is just saying that's the true, the true response that I don't know yet. Okay, so now we start performing experiments where I update the points by tests, in this case, at a five millimeter axial depth of cut for the machining operation. So I update in a smart way. 
if I get a result, I say, okay, everything below that result is stable. Um, if I get a positive or a stable result, if I get an unstable result, I say, okay, everything above that result is unstable. So not only am I updating at the point that I tested, but also surrounding points based on what I know as a machining dynamics person. So then I did it at different axial depths and the K nearest neighbor um, improves as I add these data points. And so you can see us walking through that procedure and indeed converging on the true behavior. And so this convergence criterion I showed there is the number of correct points relative to the number of total points. And so you can see that that ratio improves as we, as we proceed with the testing. Okay, so I know that was quick, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for how we can use models um, for manufacturing processes to seed a machine learning algorithm and then update that algorithm with new data. So thank you, and I'd, I'd welcome any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schmitz, for the great presentation. Uh, so now that we heard about the academic side of um, manufacturing, especially talking about the physics-based modeling, now we are going to the industry side. Um, and our next, next speaker, um, Dr. Andrew Henderson, will um, talk about the industry experience. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Andrew Henderson to the podium. He's the CTO for Premo Incorporation. He has over 15 years of experience in advanced technology, data acquisition, data analysis, and process and system modeling. And same as before, if I want to go over his accomplishments, uh, he won't have his 10 minutes to talk. So I will stop here and welcome Andrew to the podium. Thank you. I, I, um... I should be sharing my screen now. Um, let me make it full screen. Um, so uh, again, thanks for thanks for having me. I I uh, I'm happy, glad to be here. I thought maybe it, it'd be worthwhile to take just a moment, a brief moment in the beginning, to talk about who Premo is. Premo is a we we have a product called Razor that's a, a an advanced analytics engine that takes data from industrial operations and uh, analyzes it to create these notifications, these things we call insights. And those insights are, are um, bits of information that operations people can go use to improve productivity. And uh, it accomplishes, Razor accomplishes what it does um, because we, we leverage uh, a bunch of different techniques from the field of artificial intelligence. And this of industry for industry is a reflection of the fact that uh, all, all of our leaders come from industry in some form, manufacturing, mining. And so we bring our experience to how we develop Razor and apply it in the in industry. And so I, I what I have is a, a few different examples of how- uh, our Andrew, sorry to interrupt. I think we can't see your screen. So maybe you share it again, please. Oh, did I? Sorry. I didn't do the final click. I apologize. <laughs> Can you see now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. So, um, so, so I have a few examples here of of how uh, various uh, assets or aspects of artificial intelligence are applied are applied to solve problems in manufacturing. And uh, there's an arc to the presentation where I start out. I talk about consumer AI, uh, and then I end up talking about you know some of the challenges that real world in manufacturing faces and how we might deal with them. So the first example here, this is around product quality. This is, as, as um, Dr. Schmitz mentioned a moment ago, uh, taking images and recognizing cats or feature or faces in the images, being able to classify what's in them. And so we can take those exact same approaches and uh, from consumer AI and more or less directly apply them to manufacturing where if you have an inspection station that's that with a with a camera that's taking images of a product then you can feed those images uh, you can train a neural network to recognize whether the product is is a, has a defect or not and may in the class of defect and so what this requires is a large data set of images and it requires them to all be classified uh, in order to train that neural network. Uh, and typically that 
re that requires a person in the loop to do that labeling of those images so that you can train it. And then the neural network is a is a black box. We don't often know what's going on inside of the neural network, how what it does to make its what it's using to make its decision. And we'll 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 talk about each of these as we go along. But this is this is this is good though because what the image classification can do is it can offload some of that work that a human might be doing so that the human can go uh, uh, take care of other, uh, use their skills in other ways inside of manufacturing or um, uh, so, so they can use their skills in other ways inside of manufacturing. And then, um, but this is at the end of the process. So this is after something has been made and there's a lag between when the product is made and when the inspection occurs. And so oftentimes one of the first questions that comes up is, well, can you tell me sooner? I'd like to know because I don't want to wait until uh, I've potentially made five, 10, 20 more products before I get the feedback from inspection. And so we can take uh, an almost identical approach and apply it to sensor data coming from the, the machine that's doing, that's conducting the operation. So in this case, a stamping press, we might be collecting pressure, temperature, vibration, et cetera. It, and, Again, because this is a, a neural network approach, we have to train it. We need to have uh, e e event data from the machine and we have to be able to have it classified to say whether that was that led to a defect or not. And then the neural network can learn uh, to, to recognize patterns in that data that will lead to a defect. And so we've moved that further up the process. We, we still haven't necessarily prevented a defect from occurring, but we we will have uh, no identified as soon as the first one occurs that there that that there has been a, a an issue in the process. So that's so that you can stop then and not not make not continue to make more. And there are ways to to further analyze the the signal in order to save more time to be able to perhaps stop a long running process before uh, you've wasted before you spent eight nine hours perhaps making product that you can't use and there's also ways of looking at how the how the signals are trending over time and being able to be more predictive but those are that's a that's you know a, a, another conversation so one of the, as I mentioned, a neural network is a black box. It doesn't really tell us what's going on inside of it, how it's making its decisions. And so that's always a question that people want is, okay, so you tell me that there's a problem. Can you tell me why there's a problem? Uh, there are ways of doing this, one of which that's, uh, that's fairly common and, and robust is using a, a decision trees or, or more broadly a random forest and similar training Right, so you still have to have that that curated data set that's all been labeled, so that you can put it in and train, so that you can train your random forest to uh, be able to recognize those defects. Uh, but the random forest is a little different in how it's structured and built, and that each node there's a decision point at each node, and it takes it takes uh, a feature of a signal, and depending on the level of that feature, it decides which path to go down the tree in order to make its decision. And because of that, we can come back and uh, take a look at what it's doing during that decision-making process to come to the conclusion at the end. So this can help us understand what are the most important factors leading to the decision for uh, a particular defect. And so that helps understand the root cause of where it's coming from and uh, that can drive decisions that people make around how to go correct it. So all of what I've talked about so far has been supervised learning. You have that data set, you have the labels that you use um, to, to, to train the model. Oftentimes we don't have those labels. We just, we, we have data. And um, so then we have to look at applying unsupervised techniques. So uh, things like what, um, the, the clustering, the K-nearest neighbors clustering approach would be uh, considered a, an unsupervised technique, um, uh, as, as Dr. Schmitz was talking about a moment ago. 
And so what we what this example is showing is there's a there's a a piston that's pumping a pumping fluid at a station on a line in a manufacturing process, and there's an, an accelerometer that's been mounted on that that device, and the the spikes in vibration represent events, and so we use signal processing techniques in order to be able to uh, divide this long continuous data stream into those different events, and then we can apply clustering, just like Dr. Smith was saying, to be able to group those different events into categories so that we can better understand uh, what's what the content of our signal is. So there's what what comes out of it is that there's uh, this this curve that uh, we don't really know what it is. We don't at this point we don't really care why or we don't really care what it is. We just label it generically event A. It happens a bunch of times. There's another thing called call it event B. It happens a bunch of times in the data set. And then there's this thing that at first glance, it gets grouped together we call it, and it's event C. But then we can run that same clustering again on each of these groups to see if there are subgroups. And what we find is that there's actually two subgroups of, of uh, event C. And so with this, we can start to make, we can start to look for weird behavior in the system. So so um, in that event C, we can build an expectation based off of what's the most commonly occurring waveform for that particular event. And we'll, we'll call that our expectation. And then anything that doesn't uh, match to a degree with that expectation, we'll, we'll say that's, that's an anomaly, that's something different. And by tracking, and, and the, the net result of all of this is that by tracking those odd ones, those 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 unexpected events and looking at how frequently they're occurring and what's the percentage that they're occurring within a window of time, we can see this is this is showing that. So the the, the percentage of those anomalous events uh, within the, the subset, we can see a, a rise uh, at, at a point in time. And this this drop represents a period in time in which the the, the process stopped. So uh, and we the reason we say this is semi-supervised is because what happens next? We get the feedback that says, yeah, that the line stopped because there was a the the an, an incorrect fluid was put into the system. And it happened roughly 24 hours before the, the line stopped. So we can see that just by taking this sort of naive approach of identifying the anomalies within those, within that cluster of signals. Uh, we can see a rise that gives us an indication that something is different about how that operation is running. And so then we can create an alert. The alert doesn't necessarily say what the problem is and why, but it does say, hey, there's something uniquely different here. People should be paying attention, perhaps even go take a look. And we can extend this, this semi-supervised approach even further to apply some more human knowledge about the system to say, the, the different features of these curves represent different aspects of the process. And we can even say that, you know, the perhaps what's driving the anomaly condition is that this, this piston retracting, the vibration is low during that. And that could, could uh, indicate to the maintenance people what to go look at. And it gives them a better idea of, of what might be the problem, what to fix. And so the, the key takeaways of all of this is to say, this, these examples that I'm showing, we're only scratching the surface. There's so many different ways that we can continue going and exploring and, and extracting value out of, uh, by using artificial intelligence to analyze the data. And also uh, there's no need to wait to get started, meaning, meaning each one of these came from data sets that people had within their operations. And so uh, you, can, you can use those data sets and, and begin to get value. So that is, that is it for me. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for the presentation. Um, so now we are moving on to the next talk um, by Kurt Goodwin. Um, Kurt is a UMaine mechanical engineering alum, and he has over 40 years engineering experience in introducing and also developing new technologies for jet engines, gas, and wind turbines. He has served as general manager for advanced manufacturing and now 
although he is semi-retired, but he's still consulting with new manufacturing startups like Beehive 3D. So, Kurt, uh, take it away. Okay, and I think I'm sharing. Hopefully, you guys see some big engine blocks on a. Yes, perfect. So I'm as about as far from a, a, an artificial intelligence expert as there is. A mechanical engineer. I spent most of my just as as Ali just said, uh, spent most of my career uh, trying to help with the adoption of new technology. Um, so I'm going to address sort of a people aspect a little bit of, of how that does and, and some ideas that hopefully will help uh, help those of you that have something to offer to, to work with the people more successfully. Big piece of my job has been um, trying to help uh, not just uh, AI, but different digital um, folks to understand manufacturing shops and what drives them. Um, early on, we noticed that, you know, the most successful groups in this area um, had grown out of manufacturing backgrounds, or at least the teams included large numbers of people that, that had manufacturing experience um, because they understood their customers um, and what their needs and the language and drivers in a way that you know, somebody who's mostly done software might not. Um, I think it's interesting you notice both Tony and Andy have that experience themselves. Um, most factories, if you don't know this, are driven by fulfillment first and second, and to some extent uh, driven by cost. It's a very tough environment. They're basically driven to deliver a product, whether it's cars or medical devices or turbines or engines or whatever, uh, every, they're measured every week, every month, every quarter. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, business to be in. Tech companies um, come in and they might be selling machine monitoring, parts flow, better controllers. People would come in, they do the installations and then they fly home Friday morning sometimes. Um, almost inevitably something goes wrong. The engineers and the workers in the cell try and fix it. Um, and if the tech company is there, a representative, things go well. If, if they're not there, they start trying to figure out how to work around the glitch. Um, sometimes the outside helpers don't even make it back the next week. And that's that. That's the end of cooperation. At, at, at the point where you're not able to make product and the people that are trying to help you aren't there to help you, you've, you've lost them forever. Uh, they're not gonna want to work with you again. Um, those companies that are successful, um, they know how to become part of the team. They understand that there are time pressures, value being there when it's needed to preserve shipment. They've been stuck doing 100 hour weeks themselves. Um, and so they, they understand their customers somewhat. Um, the thing that you see over and over from the most successful people at doing this, regardless of the background, is they start out by talking to the guys on the floor and, and working a shift with them. They don't try and hook everything up at once. If something does go wrong, they ride through it with them. Um, and basically they, they become they do everything they can to put themselves in the, in, in the sh shoes of the people that are working in the factory. So now, whenever we work with startup manufacturers like Beehive 3 Additive that, that's mentioned here, we try and start with a mix of people that have those different backgrounds, manufacturing people that, that have had um, a lot of technology and, and uh, um, digital experience and digital and tech people that have worked on, on the factory. It doesn't have to be anybody, but if you can't communicate between yourselves, you can't appreciate what's, uh, what's being offered. It sounds simple, right? It doesn't sound like this is any particular revelation, um, but I've seen this absolutely make and break a tech startup or a digital offering or, or a company that's, that's trying to get out there. Um, so what else? Um, if you can get past that startup challenge, if you can get the relationship started, I think the next thing that's very helpful is to try and learn to think 
how to think about AI. Um, Ginny Rowdy, who, who used to run IBM, um, had a comment that AI should stand for augmented intelligence. The idea sh should not be that you're just handing control over to an autopilot, which is kind of the way some people describe some of this stuff, but rather that you have another set of eyes and brains of, uh, on the floor to try and help you understand what's going on. You know, I think, I think Andy's uh, point is very similar to this. Um, you don't necessarily know what you're looking for to begin with. You try and collect the data that you can and, and then think of it as more getting help noticing clues that might get missed otherwise. So in, in my experience, many projects start out with a very specific set of instructions or goals to attack a very specific perceived problem. You know, one example is we're trying to catch machine downtime so we can get more throughput. And up, up front, there's an assumption or an accepted idea that productivity is lost because the machines are down uh, being fixed too much. I uh, had a great example of this once. We had a shop that had, a, had to handle a big opportunity for growth in sales if they could only ship more engines. Um, we put monitoring on a lot of machines, did data collections on times and starts, watch for vibrations and events um, and oil temperatures and so forth. The first, the first breakthrough that came was once we started mapping everything and started understanding it, we discovered that uh, a number of the basic assumptions were wrong. You know, so for example, there was a piece of equipment that gated production very large engine block washer, long operation. Every it, it had to go through a single machine, and every product had to go through it. Um, on the good side of it, um, it didn't break down very often. Uh, so you know the things like oil temperatures and vibrations that we were working watching for didn't didn't turn to be immediately useful. But collecting the information. Um, mapping times and, and uh, flow through the shop, um, you, it still didn't deliver as much as we wanted from it. So the data analysis that, that flagged that specific machine, it, it, one of the things that it was noted was that the, it was often late starting specifically during time periods around the end of the morning or early afternoon. So not not that it was breaking or running right, but for some reason it would not be running and consistently at uh, a certain set of times. It turned out to be a very simple non-technical thing that basically when the da daily parts delivery truck came from the main factory, the operator for that big machine that was needed would, would try and be a good guy and jump in and help the crew unload it. So if the machine was already running, it was great. There was no problem. Everything kept going. We met flow beautifully. If not, the start had to wait until the operator finished unloading the truck, came back and got things started. The corrective action was about as simple as it gets. It was basically, hey, George, make sure the washer is running before you do anything or leave your station. Now you can argue, do you need AI to find that? It's kind of an irrelevant argument to me um, because maybe you don't need it, but it had gone unnoticed before. And the data call called attention to a specific time and period in the machine to investigate. And that's where I get the extra set of eyes helps speed up the, uh, the, the realization of what you're looking at it. The other key thing to that is that's a win. You, you need to celebrate it. The first reaction when we found that basically we were losing time because somebody was unloading a truck, everybody wants to chastise somebody else. You know, you know, the cell leader, you should have known this was a problem. The shop leader gets very defensive that, you know, it seems like his, uh, um, his shop is out of control. The operators, why did you let this happen? You should have needed a problem. You have to not let that happen because if you don't recognize that the, you found an opportunity to make things better and encourage people to, to 
fix it, work through it, um, you know, then you're you're not going to get the feedback you need, and people will actually not fudge the data, but they will they will try and interfere with the collection of data to be successful. So, you know, um, I think if you can find the right ways to encourage those kind of learnings and applications, and and for everybody to be flexible, don't. Don't look at AI as a competitor or something that's trying to take my job, but it's somebody else on the floor to help me understand what's going on. And every time we get an improvement, it's a win. All that stuff will help uh, anybody on either side be more successful, which is always the goal. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. Um, so now that you heard about academic side and industry side, um, our last presentation is um, updating you on what's going on in National Lab. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Vincent Packer, a senior research scientist in electrical and electronic system research division at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, his research is focused on computer vision and image processing um, with a predilection for high performance image processing algorithm development. So uh, Dr. Vincent, please. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. So in, the, in this presentation, I'm going to cover a lot of the work we do at the manufacturing demonstration facility. I'm going to discuss uh, the data we are collecting in the within the facility and the uh, use of AI to process such data in order to answer some of the scientific problems that, that we have in, in front of us. Of us. So uh, just uh, on my first slide, uh, I will highlight the, the link at the bottom. I don't know how I'm going to be able to share that with, uh, with you all, but there is a possibility to have a virtual tour of the facility where you'll be able to see over 100,000 square feet uh, building, about 100 type of system that we, that we are working with. So for me as a data scientist, this is a fantastic playground because I get to use to uh, play with uh, machines of different types uh, and sizes and see how data-driven methodologies can be used in order to uh, um, improve those systems or uh, assess the quality of the component coming out of those, of those systems. So that was, slide is not going to the next, okay, here we go. Um, so when, when you work with those type of, of machine in the facility, you have example on the left-hand side of the great things that you can produce with them. Uh, they look great. This component, this, this car looks great. The, the Chevy Cobra looks great. But at the end of the day, it's not necessarily functional. And the problem with that is uh, uh, when you're looking at critical components, uh, you don't necessarily have a, a way right now to uh, tell what's coming out of a machine is actually of great quality without doing any kind of uh, non-destructive evaluation of really expensive uh, testing in order to uh, validate the component, which in the, at the end of the day, uh, uh, kills the business case for, for additive altogether. And, and so our interest here is to see if there is uh, any mechanism uh, using data to get a better understanding of the process so we can develop certification methodologies for those components, but ultimately come up with a way to accelerate production of those components and improve the manufacturing technologies altogether. So we are taking a, diff, uh, a traditional smart manufacturing approach where you try to understand the process, optimize it, eventually implement feedback loop control mechanism if you can correct your process on the fly. And ultimately that will lead to a, a scenario where you'll know so much about your process and you control your process uh, uh, so well well, that you will be able to tell this component coming out of my machine, I don't need to test it because I know so much about it that I can say it's, it's actually a good component. So in order to do that, uh, you need to uh, uh, have a lot of data. And, and that's really where our, our wheelhouse here uh, um, uh, is. Uh, so we want to make sure that we can collect information at any given step of the manufacturing process. This slide is going to get extremely busy in a second. I don't want you to uh, uh, try to uh, uh, dissect everything, but just it's uh, here to give you an idea of the type of information we are interested in collecting. So if you have a goal, for example, to produce a, an N95 mask, which is something that we did, um, uh, you're going to be looking at uh, uh, the different type of, of design, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, modeling and simulation for past planning, uh, before you send this to the printer as well at the same time as the, as the feedstock. And every time you're going through this, this chain, you're going to be collecting information about the, the printer itself, 
instrumenting the printer to look at what's happening inside it, doing data registration and anomaly detection in order to uh, analyze this data. And then you have your first component printed, you're gonna chop it into pieces and go through subsequent steps of post-processing, uh, uh, testing and so on in order to create what we call a digital clone of the physical component. So you're gonna have at this point, the entire history of your component contained in a data package. And you will be able to use this data package for visualization purposes or to feed a, a larger database that as it grows will help you understand better what's going on in, in your uh, manufacturing process. When you do inter-build or intra-build uh, uh, machine learning, you're going to be able to then go back and say, okay, now I can, I can start predicting the performance of my component because I've learned so much about my process, but also act on the design itself and help uh, uh, some of the, the, the CAD software to produce uh, uh, design that are also optimized for um, uh, with material science knowledge uh, uh, in mind. So <clears throat> in order to get there, you don't want to reproduce this for every single system. So you need to come up with a unified data architecture that will help you collect such information. And the way we see this is to look at a component as a massive building block set. And what you're doing really with a machine is to tell the, the, the system grab this block and of this particular color and put it at this particular location in space. When you do this, you have data that tells the machine, to, or you have, you have processes that tell the machine how to do this, but you can also collect the data on the system to know how the machine actually performs. And so that's coming from the different data producers. Let me get a laser pointer here. Uh, oh, for some reason I can't, that's interesting. Looks like they've changed the, the system, I don't know. Um, so um, you, you're gonna have different uh, uh, data producer, you're gonna be collecting this data and each, uh, uh, each data producer will provide you one value or multiple values that can then store for each XYZ location. So now you have a feature vector of information that describe each element in space, which is a fantastic uh, 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 scenario for any kind of machine learning type of, uh, of, uh, of application. So when you have all these data packaged together, you can do anything that's listed on the right hand side of, of this slide. And so with that, I'm gonna go through some of the example on, on how you can use this data. So first, <clears throat> and that was touched on by uh, Dr. Anderson, um, uh, you can uh, observe what's happening inside your powder bed system. So if you have, for example, an image like this, you're gonna be able to see what's, what's, uh, what's happening. You can see certain type of features. And what you wanna do is classify those voxels uh, or pixels in this particular case um, uh, for to identify the type of, of, of classes they belong to. So that's kind of the first result that, that we had. We moved on to uh, something a lot more advanced. Uh, where we train a, a unit in this particular case to take a stack of, of, uh, of images of, from uh, multiple uh, modalities, train the model, and then the model spits out a, a map of uh, all the, 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 the defects uh, that you are, or defects or features that you are interested in detecting. So when you scale that up to the size of a component, you can render in, in 3D an entire map of all the features that are present in, in, in this particular component, and you can uh, then help operators of the machine uh, see things that are uh, happening when they are printing their, their, their part and see if they can um, uh, modify the process in order to get better results. What, what I, the thing that's interesting with this, and that goes along the, the comment that we uh, made before, uh, this gentleman in front of the computer here, it's, uh, he's an operator of a machine. He has no computer science background, but you can provide them tool that they can help them uh, 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 become better operator of the system. It's not, again, to replace the operator of the system, it's having a computer helping you be, uh, being uh, better at your, at your job. And so he's training his own models with the platform we put in place. So that's a, that's a nice way to uh, uh, use AI in this, in this particular case. A direct example or a direct use, oops, two slides. A direct use of this particular uh, 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 type of, of models is you can start looking at automating correction on the machine. So for example, on the binder jet system like this one, we use exactly the same techniques, putting cameras to get, get different uh, modalities of the sensor of the, of the process, uh, classify the data to get in green the part and in, in purple it's uh, incomplete spreading. That's a defect that's fairly easy to engineer uh, on the on the machine. So in this particular example here, what you have is in the x-axis the number of uh, the layer number you're going up 
uh, as uh, you go going from left to right. And here you have the percentage of pixel that were uh, 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 of a given color. So in this particular case, what we did, we, we forced the printer to create an, an incomplete spreading. So you have a percentage of, of pixel that increases roughly from 2% at the beginning to a quarter of the image was covered with, with purple pixels. At this point, we turn on the a switch and say, okay, now it's hands off and we're gonna let the AI takes over and change the process parameters in order to go down and remove this particular uh, defect. And, and you can see the curve is going down to a level that is actually lower than where it started. So you can use AI for some of those uh, uh, particular defects and make sure that you don't have an operator in front of the machine at all time in order to correct for, for some of, the, uh, of those problems that are actually fairly straightforward and, and, and easy to, uh, to correct. If you cannot implement AI for this type of correction, you can, however, uh, uh, send uh, messages to operator of the system, make sure that they, they, they see this. Another place where we use AI is on CT reconstruction. So um, the advantage of, of additive is that you know the, 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 the overall shape of your component. And you can use that at your advantage in order to help with CTR reconstruction of those samples. So if you use a traditional uh, CTR reconstruction algorithm, this is an example of what you were going to get. But we've developed a, a technique that's, that's mixing prior knowledge or, or uh, design knowledge of the component and uh, uh, um, uh, some data that we've collected uh, uh, across multiple builds in order to train a model that will uh, just uh, give you a, a overall better reconstruction of your component with less noise air and more defined uh, defects uh, detected uh, uh, within the, uh, the geometries. Those are actual two exact uh, 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 re reconstruction exa example. This is a traditional reconstruction and this is what we're getting out of, uh, of our, of our uh, uh, models. Um, one of the things that we are also interested in doing is, is pushing the machine to do things that are not supposed to do. Uh, so if you look at a, a design like this and you print it in a particular uh, system, in this particular case, it's an electron beam machine from Arkham. If you print tensile bars at the bottom and at the top and you use the black box of the machine that's provided by the manufacturer, it will print but it's not going to produce the same component. They're going to look the same, but they are not going to perform the same. If you take micrographs out of this, those uh, uh, cylinders, they are circled with the same color here, you, you see two different types of texture, which is well known is directly uh, uh, going to be correlated to the type of mechanical test you're going to get. So you're, you're seeing two different types of clusters, not the same results. However, you've collected enough data to learn different types of patterns that will lead to the production of certain type of microstructure growth or other type of microstructure growth. And so you can use this in order to fine tune the um, uh, process parameters and apply a particular type of uh, manufacturing process depending on the cross section of your geometry that you have. So that's something that, that oops, sorry, um, I'm gonna come back, okay. So that's something that, that we did here. And those examples here is printing again the same geometry. We pulled again micrographs from, from tensile bar, the bottom and the top. And you can see the microstructure are a lot more similar and the uh, 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 mechanical tests are actually uh, clustered together. So this, um, this is how you take control of your manufacturing process. So now it's not random anymore. It's not, you're not at the mercy of the decision of the engineer of the, that, that put together the machine or the programmer that put together a software that runs the machine. You're really in control of what you want to get out of the system. And when you have this level of understanding, you, I don't even need to, to test those samples anymore because I know what I'm going to get. Um, direct application of this, uh, we've used this type of, of approach and it's been accepted by, by industry as AI has been accepted by industry in this particular case to validate some of the components that were produced. So we have two examples here, one with solar turbines where we printed over 200 uh, uh, turbine blades and uh, use the, 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 the tools that I've highlighted before in order to identify which blades were of the highest quality. 80 of them went to a stress test and then on the hot fire test on, on August 25th, and they perform as, as expected, as well as traditionally uh, manufactured component. Another uh, case is uh, something related to a large program that we have at the, at the lab, which is the uh, transformational challenge reactor where we are working on, oops, um, we are working on, on printing uh, uh, components uh, uh, for nuclear type of applications. 
we had, uh, as part of this program, a, a collaboration with uh, uh, Framatome and uh, the Tennessee uh, Valley Authority uh, to print components that will go into a commercial reactor. And you have a picture of, uh, of them. And they were they went through the same type of, of, of test I, uh, or evaluation I mentioned uh, before. They went to, however, traditional um, uh, uh, NDE testing in order to make sure that what we said was actually correct. And they were approved, and they went into the uh, the, the commercial reactor at the end of, of last year. Um, so what's next for uh, uh, manufacturing data science, and probably more in particular for uh, in terms of, of AI? They, I mean, kind of mentioned that uh, earlier on on the. Uh, um, um, material informed generative design. So we, we do have generative design type of, of algorithm right now that are, that are great to simplify or, or change the way we, we design uh, components. But they are not necessarily including enough of the material information that we can, we can collect. And so that's something that we're interested in, in pushing. The augmented uh, intelligence uh, portion, again, uh, the, ne the next uh, generation of, the, of manufacturing uh, 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 operators uh, will live with a computer al alongside them and so we need to have a, a system that can help them do uh, uh, what they what they do best i'm not going to go in detail through all of this the one i will, will highlight that is more uh, related to uh, the control of a microstructure is the full optimization of what you are actually doing and making sure that you you engineer ma your manufacturing material properties in space and not solely manufacturing components and with that I'm at the end of my presentation, and I will welcome uh, uh, questions. Thank you very much, um, Vincent. Um, so I would like to thank all the speakers again for the great presentations. And now we are moving into the question and answer period. So um, thank you, everybody, for posting the questions uh, there. So I will start with the first question for Tony. Um, so what is the biggest challenge that you see for implementing AI into manufacturing domain? Well, if we are using a classification approach, um, you'd like to have an automated uh, technique for classifying that data, right? Otherwise, you've sort of defeated the purpose if I have to look at every signal and decide what happened. Um, so I think um, that would be a, a, an obstacle. Um, for widespread implementation. And that, you know, I tell you what's interesting is that you bring in the domain experts with the machine learning experts. And I think that collaboration is essential. Great, thank you very much. And next question is um, for Vincent. Um, what would be a possible approach when the system don't have a well-defined physics space um, model. So if there is too many unknowns, for example, in the case of 3D printing. We, we've seen in the, um, uh, uh, in, in the past that a lot of the physics-based model for some of the, the, the technologies are not um, are overly complex and not necessarily correct uh, at the end of the day. And so the way we approach this, so for example, for the microstructure control I, I mentioned, uh, we, we've used high physics-based models uh, uh, to get there, but really realized that it was better to go through a, a in-situ monitoring approach to better understand what was happening for a, a, a variety of, of combinations of the, um, uh, of, the, of the manufacturing process and work with lower order models in order to uh, get a, an answer more, more quickly. Um, they, they are like a, a lot of, of those models that, that seem to be right uh, but when you apply them at large scale, first, sometimes you can't because you, can, you cannot compute uh, uh, the, the, the results for, for a large component. Uh, and, and sometimes they are overly complex and it's not necessary. So good, do, finding a, a good balance between uh, what sensor will provide you and what models rightly uh, selected and apply to sub-region within your, within your geometry is probably a better approach uh, uh, for, for most systems. Thank you very much. And next question I'm gonna ask uh, Andrew. Um, so we talked about a neural network you know, and different approaches. So in terms of like being in industry, what kind of AI or machine learning tools um, is mostly used in industry, and how do you decide which one of those is appropriate for your application? So the uh, 
in terms of what's most common, I mean, I, I, I'd probably have people arguing with me about linear regression being an AI tool, but I, I would, uh, it's a way of, of defining a model of something. So, I, I mean, that one's been there for a long time. Uh, but in terms of like what we consider advanced AI, I think we're seeing a lot more neural networks come up. There are a lot of people asking for that use case at the very beginning where I've got images of products I want to classify if they're defects or not. Um, beyond that, I mean, they, they all have their different, um, their different use cases, unsupervised techniques, because you often don't know what you don't know. So let's go do some si signal processing and then let's group them together and then review those results. And though, then you have aha moments where you say, oh, well, I, yeah, of course that makes sense to me that, that those things would be grouped together or, um, or the, there's a, there's some press there using like a Markov chain or some sort of thing. You might be able to determine precedence of events or, or the, the sequence of events. And says, of course, now it all makes sense that, that those things happen in that order. So I don't, I don't know that that's a, a great answer to what's the most prevalent, but it's to say that there's a lot of different techniques that people are applying. That's great. Thank you very much, Andy. And the next question I'm going to ask Kurt, um, you mentioned about um, the, the other way of looking at AI as instead of saying artificial intelligence, we talk about it as augmented intelligence, right? And I got a comment from one of our attendees, uh, Dr. Terry Yu, mentioning that in 1994 ACM uh, Newell Award acceptance speech, Frederick Brooks also mentioned something very similar and called AI as IA or intelligence amplification. Um, so the question is that since you have a lot of experience in industry, um, where do you think um, the industry will benefit most from incorporating AI? Um, and not just from technological point of view, from the acceptance point of view, from the engineers who are on the floor. So they don't feel they're losing their jobs, but rather they see that there's somebody helping them. Right, I think that's one of the reasons that I like the augmented uh, um, intelligence idea. And I saw that comment, I thought that was great. I, I stole it for another day. Um, I, I think anything that overcomes the initial doubt is helpful. There's, there's a, and, and, and I think it's been unfortunately provoked to some extent by a lot of discussion in the, in print and in the media, um, where people seem to want to um, get people afraid of robots. I, I think once people um, working in any shop run into a success and start to see uh, the opportunities for it, um, as being help and not competition, um, it that that overcomes any doubt or sales pitch better than 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 you know anything you can say. So we, you know, I have a colleague who likes to talk about getting base hits. Um, you don't have to solve world hunger the first time out. The first time you uh, you know they work with somebody like. Tony and he helps them not break tools off anymore because they're driving the machine too hard. Or, or uh, uh, I know Andy's had some great use cases on, on recognizing unrecognized limits. Those breakthroughs do more to win people over than all the talk you can imagine. Um, but I think starting out by even, the, the best way to start out is to just just to say, well, look, these are not here to replace you. These are here to help us find problems and fix them and get through it. And then look for that chance to show everybody. Um, that's the best thing I know. Thank you very much, Kurt. Um, we are at time. So I just want to mention that um, I would like to thank again all the speakers, all of you attendees for attending this event. If you liked this event, AI for Manufacturing, you can join us uh, on the first Thursday of every month. In April, we have AI for Agriculture. In May, we have AI for Healthcare. And in June, we are going to present multiple projects which are funded by the UMAIN AI Seed Grant. I also want to thank our sponsor, Office of Vice President for Research, sponsoring University of Maine AI Initiative, um, and also my colleagues at the AI Steering Committee, Doctors uh, Susan McKay, Terry Yu, Roy Turner, 
Sharmila Mukhopadhyay, Shalin Jain, Saul Allen, and Jason Sharlan. And also um, in the background, I would like to thank um, Office of Research um, help that we got, uh, the, uh, Melinda Pelletier, who is actually running the background Zoom here for us. Um, I know we have a few more questions, but we are out of time, so we will um, answer those offline. And again, uh, don't forget to um, uh, respond to the survey request we will send out later, so we'll hopefully we'll make these events better. So thanks again, all the speakers and attendees, and enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great day.